A single engineering decision powered Big Muskie. 13,500 tons of electric ambition was meant to turn Ohio coal into corporate gold. The machine could strip twice the volume of the Panama Canal, fueled by enough electricity to light a city. But behind Bucyrus Erie's legendary pedigree was a gamble. They concentrated all hope and all risk in one colossal walking excavator. How do you build a future so big it brings down its own creators? The answer begins decades before the first shovelful of Earth. Steam rose from the foundries of South Milwaukee long before the world ever heard the name Big Muskie. Bucyrus Erie, the company behind the machine, built its reputation on the backs of iron giants, machines that didn't just move Earth, but carved history itself. Their steam shovels chewed through the jungles and rock of Panama in the early 1900s, clearing the way for a canal that would reshape global trade. In 1915, their catalog promised buyers something rare in the age of rapid change. Machines built for generations, not seasons. That pledge wasn't marketing. It was a contract with the future. For decades, Bucyrus Erie's name carried weight in every mining town and on every continent where raw ground met human ambition. Their engineers designed for endurance, not just output. Machines were expected to outlast their operators, to keep working long after the first coat of paint faded and the world's priorities shifted. Every bolt and bearing reflected a philosophy. Reliability was its own kind of power. As the years rolled on, the company's legacy grew. By the 1940s, cable shovels from Bucyrus Erie and its rivals, Marion and P&H, had reached the limits of what cables and steel could accomplish. Mines grew deeper. The appetite for coal and minerals soared, but even the best machines stalled against the hard ceiling of physics and old technology. The industry needed a new way forward, and Bucyrus Erie was determined to find it. That drive to break new ground came from a lineage of risk takers and problem solvers. The company's South Milwaukee factory wasn't just a workshop. It was a proving ground for the next leap in heavy equipment. Every innovation, every oversized order, was measured against the company's own history, a history of machines that had already moved mountains and bridged oceans. When Central Ohio Coal Company came calling with a job that seemed impossible, Bucyrus Erie's answer drew on decades of trust and a belief that the future belonged to those who dared to build for it. In the mid-1950s, Bucyrus Erie's engineers gathered in windowless rooms, surrounded by blueprints and the hum of test benches. The challenge was not just size, it was how to power a machine that could move mountains without breaking itself or the mine's budget. Diesel and hydraulics had their limits. Hydraulic lines burst under pressure. Diesel engines strained and failed under loads that only grew heavier. The answer, they believed, was electricity. The decision was not made on a whim. Engineers studied torque curves late into winter nights, comparing the relentless pull of electric motors to the unpredictable force of hydraulics. Electric drives offered something no piston or pump could match. Infinite torque at low speeds, fewer moving parts, and the promise of lower operating costs over decades. The gamble was bold, commit to a system that would draw power from the grid through a trailing cable thicker than a man's leg, carrying 13,800 volts straight from the mine's substation to the heart of the drag line. This cable would snake across the pit floor, feeding energy to a network of motors that would swing, hoist, and walk the machine. The engineers knew what they were risking. Every calculation, every memo, pointed to a single unavoidable truth. The more you concentrate power and function in one machine, the more you gamble everything on its reliability. There would be no backup, no second chance if the cable failed or a motor burned out. But the potential rewards, a single operator moving as much earth in one pass as a convoy of trucks, 
were too great to ignore. The doctrine was clear. Build for scale, trust in the math, and accept the consequences of betting the entire operation on one colossal, electrically driven solution. As the last test bench shut down and the final numbers were signed off, Bucyrus Erie committed itself and Central Ohio Coal to a path with no easy retreat. The future would be powered by electricity and all the risk would run through a cable as thick as a man's arm. Blueprints stacked in the drafting rooms at South Milwaukee told a story of ambition measured in feet and tons. The machine on paper stretched 310 feet from base to boom tip. A single bucket drag line meant to tear through Ohio's deep overburden in one relentless motion. Design documents filled entire filing cabinets, calculations for steel thickness, surs untis under stress tolerances, and the arc of a 220 cubic yard bucket that would move as much earth in one pass as a fleet of trucks. Engineers debated every detail, but the central philosophy was never in doubt. All capability and all power concentrated in one machine. Bucyrus Erie's marketing team distilled this into a bold promise. One machine, one operator, one solution. The brochures showed a lone figure at the controls, dwarfed by a machine that could swing a bucket weighing 230 tons empty and lift 325 tons fully loaded. The logic was seductive. Fewer moving parts, fewer operators, less complexity. If the machine worked as planned, it would rewrite the economics of surface mining. But inside the design reviews, a quieter conversation ran beneath the optimism. Every engineer understood the risk. With no backup, a single failure could bring the entire operation to a standstill. There would be no redundancy, no second unit to pick up the slack if a main drive failed or a boom section cracked. Simplicity at this scale meant fragility, one point of failure, one chance to get it right. The final blueprints reflected this tension. The boom spanned longer than a football field, anchored to a base designed to spread the weight of 13,500 tons across soft Ohio ground. Every weld, every bolt, carried the weight of the company's reputation and the future of Central Ohio coal. On paper, the machine was perfect. In practice, it would be a test of whether engineering could overcome the risks of putting all bets on a single colossal hand. Convoys of flatbeds and rail cars snaked across state lines, each one hauling a piece of a machine that no single road or rail could contain. Shipping permits stacked up in county offices as steel beams and plate sections, some as thick as a city phone book, rumbled through small towns at walking speed. Local headlines tracked the progress. A boom section heavier than a loaded locomotive here. A tub segment that blocked intersections there. The bucket arrived last. A 230-ton steel maw with teeth as long as a man's arm, rumored to be able to swallow a house whole. People came out at night just to watch it pass, headlights sweeping over a shape too big to fit in memory. At the assembly site near Cumberland, the ground trembled under the weight of cranes and crawler tractors. Crews worked around the clock, their arc welders painting the Ohio night with flashes of blue and white. The air smelled of cut steel and burnt insulation. Each bolt had to be torqued to exacting standards, each weld inspected and re-inspected, because the smallest error could ripple through millions of pounds of moving metal. The boom, once lifted and pinned in place, stretched longer than a football field, casting a shadow that crept across the valley as the sun rose and set. No single person could see the whole machine at once. Welders crawled through the belly of the beast, tightening lines and sealing seams, while riggers balanced on catwalks high above the ground, guiding sections into place with hand signals and shouted numbers. The work was relentless, rain or shine, day or night. Floodlights turned the pit into a false dawn, and the machine took shape not all at once, 
but in the slow, deliberate joining of parts too large for any one crew to claim as their own. Pride ran through every shift change. The men and women on site knew they were building something that belonged to another scale entirely. A machine that would outlast their careers, maybe even their lifetimes. Seven people kept Big Muskie alive, each with a job that demanded both skill and nerve. John Paul Reed, the oiler, started most mornings at the base of the 310-foot boom. His climb meant checking grease lines and bearings high above the pit, even when frost slicked the metal. When it shut down, we'd climb up, Reed remembered. The silence of a stopped muskie was a warning. The mine's heartbeat had paused, and every minute mattered. Dave Bailey, the electrician, carried responsibility for 13,800 volts coursing through the machine. Federal certification was only part of the challenge. The real test came during storms and power surges, when a single mistake could light up the whole pit. Bailey's shift rarely ended on time. Big Muskie ran 364 days a year, and the lights on the drag line never faded, even as the Ohio night pressed in. Eddie, the supervisor, had been promoted three times, but never left the floor for long. He stayed close to the controls, guiding the operator through each pass. The drag line's size fooled outsiders. Precision, not force, defined the job. You didn't run it, you supervised it, one operator said. Each movement of the 220 cubic yard bucket, capable of hauling 325 tons in a single swing, demanded focus, not bravado. Carl Wickham welded through countless shifts, his torch tracing seams in steel plates thick as phone books. Later, when Black Lung forced him to carry an oxygen tank, he visited the memorial and ran his hand over the old bucket, pride still in his voice. Big Muskie moved 8,000 cubic yards an hour, enough to fill 17,000 dump trucks in a day. Over its life, it shifted 608 million cubic yards, twice the volume of the Panama Canal. Every record it set was built on the backs of those seven, working under floodlights that turned night into day, every hour a reminder that nothing this big could afford to stop. A single breakdown could silence the entire Muskingum mine, and in the early 1980s, that nightmare became real. Inspectors found the steel tub the massive ring anchoring Big Muskie's 13,500-ton weight was wearing out. No backup machine waited in the wings. Everything depended on one unprecedented repair. Operations Superintendent Steve Hook faced the impossible task to lift a 27 million pound machine just high enough to slide a new tub underneath, without twisting the steel or risking collapse. The pit filled with welders, riggers, electricians, and heavy equipment specialists. Hundreds cycled through in shifts, working around the clock under floodlights. The ground shook as hydraulic jacks pressed upward, timber towers braced the load, and surveyors checked every fraction of an inch. The old tub came out in pieces, torched and unbolted, while new steel segments arrived and were welded into a continuous ring. Every weld had to be flawless. One mistake could doom the entire project. While the structure hung in the air, production stopped cold. Coal shipments slowed to a trickle. The accountants counted losses in real time, and the rest of the mine stood idle, waiting for the giant to stand again. At the same time, a failed motor could mean weeks of silence, as replacement parts had to be built from scratch and shipped from Bucyrus Erie's Midwest factory. There were no spares, no shortcuts, just long days and longer nights, with the future of the mine hanging on every bolt and weld. For Hook and his crew, the lesson was brutal. When all your hopes ride on one machine, a single breakdown brings the whole world to a halt. Coal markets in the 1970s did not stand still. While Big Muskie's bucket tore through Ohio's overburden, 
the world outside the pit was shifting. Competitors like Caterpillar, Marion, and P&H put their faith in fleets of smaller machines, each one easier to finance, faster to train crews for, and far less risky if something broke. Where Muskie's downtime froze an entire mine, a modular fleet could lose one unit and keep digging. Banks noticed, and the industry began to reward diversification over spectacle. Loan officers began favoring diversified equipment packages, spreading risk across several machines instead of betting everything on a single 13,500-ton colossus. Financing terms reflected that skepticism. Shorter loan durations, higher interest rates, and stricter collateral requirements for one-off giants. The policy environment turned just as sharply. The 1977 Clean Air Act amendments hit high sulfur coal producers with new rules. Power plants needed expensive scrubbers, and mining companies faced mandatory land reclamation. Compliance costs soared, sometimes by one-third, and the regulatory paperwork multiplied. Environmental hearings in Ohio made headlines. Activists spotlighted strip mining's scars, and regulators tightened oversight. Every new rule chipped away at the thin margins that Big Muskie once made possible. Coal prices swung up after the oil embargo, then tumbled as utilities shifted to cleaner Western reserves. Meanwhile, used equipment markets filled with standardized machines that were easy to resell and easy to repurpose. Big Muskie, built for one job in one place, became a stranded asset. No contractor wanted the burden. No bank wanted the risk. The same scale that once promised efficiency now locked the company into a dead end, as external forces closed off every path to recovery. In 1999, the last echoes of Big Muskie's labor faded across the hills of southeastern Ohio. The giant that once moved mountains for central Ohio coal was now reduced to a puzzle of steel, cut apart by torches wielded by crews who had grown up in its shadow. The boom, which once stretched longer than a football field, came down in sections. Each piece was lowered with care, then hauled away for scrap. The entire machine, once worth $25 million, was sold for less than $700,000 in salvage. For many in Morgan and Muskingum counties, the site was less a demolition than a kind of funeral. But not everything vanished. The bucket, 230 tons of battered steel that had bitten into the Ohio earth more than 500,000 times, was spared. Local miners, their families, and community leaders fought to save it, refusing to let the last remnant of their industrial cathedral disappear. After months of debate, the bucket was moved to a hillside at Miners Memorial Park near McConnellsville. It took a convoy of trucks and a carefully plotted route to deliver it, inching through towns where generations remembered the machine's electric hum. Today, the bucket sits silent in the grass, rusted but unbowed. Children scramble inside its hollow shell, and the handrails are polished smooth by the touch of thousands of visitors. For some, it is a playground. For others, it is a monument to ambition, to loss, to the men and women who worked beneath floodlights and risked everything to keep the mine running. The community keeps the memory alive, not just as a relic of the past, but as a reminder of what it cost to move so much earth and what was left behind when the giant finally fell. Today, as industries chase ever larger projects, Giga factories, data centers, and energy grids, the lesson remains. Scale can breed fragility as surely as it breeds power. Big Muskie's colossal ambition became its undoing, a warning etched in rusted steel. In a world obsessed with bigger and faster, resilience, not size, defines survival. What would you risk for a chance at greatness?